It's never too late to start doing what's right. I am Meg, and you are listening or watching the open-ended podcast where we go deeper than the Sunday sermon. Um, I am guilty of having a busy lifestyle, and from our guest who's here with us today, I've learned that I should probably slow down. Hi, my name's Mike. I've been a Christian for about 20 years, and for the last 12, I've really been diving into the Christian faith and trying to understand it better and live by the principles written in the Bible, God's Word. And I am definitely guilty of not doing what's right, so I'm really excited to have our guest on today. Our guest is Pastor Joe Chambers. He comes all the way from Colorado to visit us. Pastor Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. So what makes you qualified to be on the Open Ended Podcast? Well, I got invited, <laughs> so that helps. Yes. Um, I think that, that to, to the idea of going slow, by the way, that's a quote by Thomas Jefferson. It's never too late. Oh. To start doing what's right. Okay. I want to give him attribution to that. Um, but slowing down has been um, a mantra of mine. I'm trying to normalize it. Uh, I think everyone would do a lot better if we could slow down. So I've been going slow for a long time. Yeah, one of the things that you said was you're an evangelical for slowing down. Is I, that... No, I said... I'm going to correct you. Okay. Um, I, I want, I'm evangelizing. I'm an ev evangelist for going slow. Evangelist for going slow. Yeah. Like Especially that. with ministry leaders who mm -hmm. yeah. wear their busyness as a badge of honor at some level. And it's usually a badge of, in my mind, of laziness. Mm -hmm. I, heard, I heard Eugene Peterson say one time that um, a pastor who... Um, preaches a long sermon is a lazy pastor. Mm. And I find that to be offensive because I tend to preach very long, as you guys know. Um, but it, what he means by that is that I'm, I'm not paying attention to the words and I'm, I'm filling it with some things that probably do not belong there. And so, uh, so those are areas of my life that I can fill space up instead of allowing some space in between mm. yeah so true so over the weekend we have you for one more night here at the church right? tonight and tomorrow night mm -hmm. so two more nights really enjoyed your just being here first time i met you i heard you speak you're a fantastic storyteller got an amazing voice i found that out listening to your videos but one of the things, and I really thought I was going to get a lot more emotional when you were speaking because you touched on a number of key things that were deciding points in my life that changed my life. So I kind of, I know this is uh, about our guests, but I have to tell you guys the story just to give you context. But so all my life, I grew up mad, angry, and frustrated as a person into my adulthood and I never understood why. I couldn't figure it out. I knew that something was, was wrong inside of me and something was hurt. And I never could figure it out. Went through my alcoholism, my drug addiction. I had a, I had a good father. He was, he was present. He wasn't like he, you know, my mom and him got a divorce and he just left and wasn't around. But he was the father that, you know, at 12 years old, I could have done, I did a good job, but I could have done it a little bit better. He was mm -hmm. one of those types of fathers, which I find is pretty common, especially in growing up in my era. As we had fathers, we, we joke around as we, we can't, you can't hurt our feelings. We held the flashlight for, your, for our dads. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's kind of the generation that I grew up in. And don't get me wrong, I love my dad to pieces. He just, he had his own issues that he was working through, but I never grew up with the acceptance of my father the way that we should have for years i was broken just could not understand why i was so angry until i sobered up and i started reading a book by john eldridge the wild at heart and the way that john was explaining is we go through stages in life and to becoming a man and one of the one of the stages that we go through is we need to know that we're a beloved son i feel the tears coming on now now that i'm on camera. While you're talking about it, I didn't feel anything. 
so when you were talking about it, I knew I knew what you were talking about because I experience it. I, I uh, mentor men all the time. It's the first thing I look for in their past to see what's broken inside. But I remember laying in my bed and I read that passage from John and, and he just said to pray to God and said, you know, and before I even got the words out, God just said, I love you. You're my beloved mm-hmm. son. And in that instant, in that instant, it's one of the first, or it's one of the rare occasions where I feel that, uh, felt this, but in that instant, all the anger went away, all of the hurt, everything that I've ever felt growing up, immediate went away because I was his beloved son. And fast forward a couple of years later, my dad ended up dying of cancer and, and on his deathbed, literally on his deathbed, he's got the mask on, he pulls his mask off and I I'd, I'd cleaned up, I'd sobered up and became a pretty good guy at this point. And he was praising me for the man that I turned out to be. But even after saying that, he, he still finished with, it took you long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I was completely healed at that point as I love my dad. It's just the way the man is. But I just kind of chuckled when he said that because it, it didn't hurt me the way that it used mm-hmm. to. You know, It didn't affect me that way. And by no means, don't get me wrong, did he mean that in a mean way. That was just the way that he communicated. But I don't think that us as men and fathers understand how detrimental that is to our kids. Mm-hmm when we talk to them like that. Mm. So long-winded story to go into saying that beloved son was my favorite part that you spoke about. And I'm always, uh, my ears always perk up when I hear about beloved Mm. son because I know exactly how important that is to men, even men my age and my middle Mm -hmm. age, that we we are the beloved son and beloved daughters. Mm -hmm. I never considered that until you said that, Mm -hmm. beloved sons and daughters. But I wanted to give you the backup context before I went ahead and let you give me your psychological (laughs) impact on how messed up my crafting is. (laughs) Well, uh, the, the truth of the matter is we all have a father wound. Everybody does because we all had fathers who were sinful. Every father was that way. And I have a father wound. My father is a member of my church, attends every Sunday. He's 86 years old, and um, he's rescued me many times from my terrible decisions. But he left a father wound in me that I still battle to this day. I have inflicted a father wound on my three sons. It's just the truth because I'm a sinful human being. And so I, I know that every time I stand in front of um, a group of people, there everybody there is carrying that wound. Now, it might also come from mom. So, um, I mean, I don't want to leave moms out. Moms yeah. inflict wounds just as deeply, maybe sometimes more deeply than fathers. Um, so we all have them. The, the beauty about our identity as the beloved of God is that God loves us not based upon what we do, but based upon the fact that he's God and you're you. That's, that's the criteria. The criteria has nothing to do with performance. Um, I heard somebody say that God is madly in love with you and that might drive you crazy, that there's nothing more you can do to get him to love you more. And so I think about that. I, I could tell God, I love you with all my heart, God, and God would say thank you. And then I could also shake my fist in his face and say I hate you with all my heart and God's not going to love me any less mm-hmm. because he loves me because he's God and I'm Joe. It's not based upon how my father treated me or my mother. We often, I think, project onto God things that do not belong to him. So if I were to say to my dad, Dad, I hate you, it would hurt his heart and he might get reactive. But God does not get reactive if I say something stupid to him. He's a constant when it comes to love. And I, it took me a long time 
to to accept that and to realize that and um and i think that's part of growing and maturing as a follower of jesus is to realize that he is exactly who he says he is he's the constant love of the universe and he loves me he's madly in love with you and there's nothing you can do about that mm. I love that. And I feel like it's uh, that's such a healing statement, too. So I, I don't think people understand how much God actually loves us and how much that He can heal mm-hmm. the father wounds and mm-hmm. the mother wounds. Mm-hmm. And I'm right there with you. I was a horrible father to my boys, and I carry that burden every day, even though I've made amends and made amends with myself and with the boys. But I carry that father burden around, too. I tell, I say all the time, you know, I was an okay, I was an okay dad. I'm a world class class grandpa, though. I'm really good at that. And, but I'll tell you something that I did a few years ago. Um, The regrets I have really stem in many ways around my parenting as, as a father. I have three sons. They're all old and older and out of the house and that kind of thing. But this is a bit germane to the conversation, so I'll just tell you about this. A few years ago, one of my sons was going through a very difficult time emotionally. He doesn't walk with the Lord. And um, and so I wrote him a letter. And in the letter, I confessed to him some of the regrets I have as a dad. And I told him where I felt like I had failed him as my son and I went into details about some of those things. This is where I failed you. And um, I should have been this for you, and I should have been that for you, and I wasn't. And um, all of that was an effort to try to take responsibility for the um, unintentional wounds I left and some of the intentional wounds. And um, so then I started to share with them what I saw in them and what was beautiful about their souls. And so each of them are three different men. And so I told each of them where I think they are absolutely gorgeous, beautiful men. And I I didn't bring up a single flaw. I didn't bring up a single, but you could have done better. I, I just said, this is what I see. And it was not, it wasn't, It wasn't untruthful. It was exact. I mean, I'm able to see in my 60s, in my son's things, I couldn't see when I was in my 30s, in my 40s. And so I just told them all that I saw in them, each of them, and uh, how proud I was of them. And, you know, I sent them all. It was a handwritten letter, and I mailed it to each of them. And they were they were all very grateful. They didn't know that the other two were getting one. I think I probably told each one of them they were my favorite. (laughs) and promise not to tell your brother kind of thing. And so, which I'm sure they did. But anyway, I part of that's just an effort to do. I want to do as much as I can to bring some a balm of Gilead, uh, some healing to a wound that I inflicted because I'm a sinful man. And what you're speaking to is that if God loves you so much, even with all your shortcomings, he still loves you the same then when you're, delivering all of your perfect actions and your sinless lifestyle, if one can say that they have that, right? They they can say that they do. Um, God loves you the same, right? After you do all of this serving in church and all of this stuff that looks really good on paper and say, God, I'm doing this for you. He's not going to say, good, I love you more now. He says, I love you the same as I did when, you know, I love you the same as I did when dot, dot, dot. I feel like with what you're saying about this truth of God is his statement all the time. I love you the same as I did now that you're 60 as I did when you were 20. I love you the same now that your kids are all grown as I did when you felt like you were being a bad father to them when they were younger. He loves you the same. And that concept, I think, can get flipped to both sides. People who feel like they have a lot of things that they couldn't provide or that they did wrong, and to the people who are just rushing for his approval to do all of these things and we do get raised with earthly parents who expect things of us and we let them down. And then, I mean, I operate off of that a lot. If I'm not making my parents proud, is what I'm doing even worthwhile? Like I'm doing it to impress someone. 
right? And then we apply that to Father God as if that's how he operates. We have, a, we, we, we have developed what I call an exchange relationship. It's not unlike what we have with a, with a local coffee shop. As long as the coffee is good and cheap, I'll get coffee here. But if there's a better coffee shop down the street that gives me better coffee and cheaper, I'll go down there because I want a good return for my money. We're that way with people, too. Um, I'll be your friend as long as it benefits me. But if there's a better friend who's cheaper and you know gives me better, you know, laughs at my jokes a little laughter i might go there too we do this in church we do it all the time and so this and so the whole idea meg of of um, god loving me because i and he loves me more if i'm good that that is a that is a lie from the devil and it will seduce us into having a, an exchange relationship with god then we are good as best we know how to be good. And then somebody gets cancer. And now I think, what good does it do to be good if it doesn't get me something? And isn't that religion? We can it's do religion. all of these things, but yeah. be far. We can offer up all of mm -hmm. these, you know. We had a preacher come um, visit us. He's a like a district supervisor in Foursquare or something. And he came and spoke. And one of the lines I really remember him talking about was <laughs> he was getting really um, into what he was saying. And he's like, you know, the devil is just, just out there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Greet at the door, prance up and down the aisles during worship, raise your hands, do all of the things you want. He's like, sure, go ahead and do that. The devil is like, that doesn't phase me because I have all these other ways to keep you far. You can do all of these things that make you feel in the moment like you're so close to God and you have this intimacy with him. But if you don't like really have it, you're just fooling yourself into, and that, that to me, like that whole thing, that's religion in one word, that whole concept of all of these, um, motions we're doing or not even just motions, but maybe we get really caught up in feelings, right? It might not feel like I'm like in Catholic church, I'm standing when the priest stands and I sit down when the priest sits, those remind me of motions, but also the feelings based, you know, movements of my whatever could not be genuine if I'm not actually True. intimate with them. I think it's very natural, though, don't you think, that if I'm behaving a certain way that um, God will smile on me, you know, that's very natural. I, there's a story about, about Sister Teresa of the Villa, and she is riding in a, an ox cart. And this is way back, hundred, I mean, a thousand years ago, and I may be wrong about that number. Anybody facts checks that? But um, a long time ago, she's riding in an ox cart, and she hit a, they hit a pothole, and she landed, and she got, she flew off this cart, this wagon, and landed in a mud puddle, and she was so mad, and she slammed her hands down into the mud, and she looked up to heaven and said. God, you'd have a lot more friends if you treated the ones you had a little better. And wow. I just love that quote <laughs> because I think that's how we feel. She was just giving voice to how we sometimes feel. You know, what good does it do to go to church and to read my Bible and to pray diligently and my wife get cancer? What, what, what does this gain to me? Well, that right there tells you that I have a relationship for God for what he can do for me. And it's natural to feel this, but uh, it ultimately sets us up for a deeper wound than than he than we need. I see. I've always struggled with that one. Just even what you've just said, like why would God allow cancer? Why would God allow the kid to die? Why would God allow? Why would God allow? Never know how to answer that question. Well, when you figure it out, will you let me know? <laughs> I have it asked to me all the time. Yeah. You, you, well, you and I have talked quite a few times independently, and uh, we kind of, and this kind of falls into that category. Like there's, there's absolutes that we know in the Bible that are written directions. There's things that are vague that we have to use our own judgment for. And then there's things I, I call them the three buckets, and there's the third, which is. We're just making it up as we go. We're just talking out of the side of our neck almost sometimes. So 
I like that. And that's one of those things I don't know, but it's going to be a question that I ask or that I'm going to know when I get up to heaven, just like that. And is the world, was the world made in six days or was it made in six million years? I don't know. It's yeah, going to be yeah. asked though. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so be, look, before we move off of the beloved uh, father topic though, I know you're really close with your dad. You're, you, uh, I would, I would put you in the label as a daddy's girl. Through and through. Through and through. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to add on to that? Like, as the female perspective, do women... What, what does it look like for a woman to go through the beloved daughter phase? Well, my experience with... Well, hope I don't cry now, too. I Mike, don't. look at... I, knew, I, um, I was questioning <laughs> if I should go there or not, but I can't leave you out of this question. My experience with kind of applying that my earthly father's love for me. It, I think in my case, because my dad and I do have a relationship and I've never questioned that he loves me so much. And my dad has gone through some things and he has, there are so many reasons that we could have a rocky relationship. Um, but I think what kept us together is that when he was in front of me, he could look me in the eye and say, I'm proud of you and I love you. Mm. And For me, that helped me kind of apply this idea when I was um, kind of seeking out a relationship with God for the first time in my life, which was only about five years ago. Um, that concept helped me apply that much more easily than I think other women might have if they have different you know, relationships with their earthly fathers. I could see that being a really, um, a much harder thing to conceptualize that, ha you know, and I think every that's kind of a, a given, right? Everyone might be able to assume, like, well, I don't have a good relationship with my father. How is how is that father ever going to love me if my earthly one didn't? Um, especially because if you don't have a relationship with God, the only father that you can point to that knows anything about you is your earthly one. If you're not recognizing who actually created you, right, and all of those the things that we know and love about God as our maker, um, that's what our reference point is. But... For me, I have I have mommy issues, and my mom and I have talked about that extensively. So, if she listens to this podcast and hears me say that, she's gonna be like, "Yeah, we do. <laughs> yep." And we can agree on that. And we hardly had a relationship for. We started our relationship when I started my relationship with the Lord. Oh. Um. We did not have a, a closeness or an intimacy at all. And it's probably part of what made me really cling to my dad is he, he's the one looking me in the eyes and saying, I like, love you. Mm -hmm. My mom, of course, did her best all the time. I don't question it at all that she ever had bad intentions for me whatsoever. I know she was doing what she knew to be best at the time. And so me grappling with all of those things when I came to the faith and understood I have, I have um, repairing to do in my relationships, and I have an eagerness to show Jesus to people who I thought I will never talk to again. You know, I've broken up with my family multiple times. I've totally gone astray. Part of my testimony is I call myself prodigal daughter, like many people probably do, but I, I really, that story really resonates with me about the prodigal son. Um, and I, I did come back to a family who was just waiting for me. And so I'm thankful for that. That might not have you know been the case if all of this happened when I was much younger. But with time, um, I now, I think I have a great relationship with both of my parents individually. Um, but I do find it really, really connected to what our earthly relationship with our fathers are it informs us. And that has shown me so much what to look for in a husband. Um, I am so confident that my husband's going to be like the best dad ever and make our kids feel so valued and loved. So I can't wait for that. Um, but that concept just has informed me so much in my life, how important it is for the father figure in a girl's life from my perspective. hundred so percent. Can, can I just say something a little yes. bit about that? And that is that one of the things that I've come to believe is that um, our fathers and our mothers are the lens through which we see God, especially from ages 
one or two to age five or six. Do you so, think it's because we associate father? I, it's easier to do father because father, uh, God the Father, yeah. and our fathers. Okay. But but it's it's but it don't discount mom. Um, it, if I could be very unbaptist here, you know, I would say that the Holy Spirit is the feminine side of God, and so I think it's really easy to look through our parents. And it's important to know that that when I when I look at my dad, my dad was the picture of God for me. Now, a good dad is at some point, and a good mom is going to say, I am not omnipotent. I'm not omniscient. I'm not omnipresent. Therefore, look through me to God, but I'm not God. So there's there's a ha- handoff, but I think it's supernatural. Supernatural? Did I just say that? It is very natural, and it's supernatural for us to look through our parents as a lens. Now, the challenge is, is if... I have a dad that is not paying attention, or if I have a dad who is very um, hostile, that lens is convoluted and convexed, and it distorts my view of God. And so in a lot of the work that I do, I've noticed that there's a lot of repair work that has to be done because the lens has been distorted. Um, But one of the things that's important to remember, too, is that even if you don't have a great dad or a great mom, if that parenting relationship is is not ideal, um, the part of the restlessness and the angst that we feel because we had those parents, the presupposition is you know what a good parent should be because you don't have one and you know this isn't right. And so that that sense is that where did that come from? Where did I get this this thing inside me that thinks, I don't think dad's supposed to be this way. Yeah. I don't think mom's supposed to be this way. Where did that idea come from? It comes from our heavenly father, mm. our heavenly parent. And so I try to share with people the reason that you're upset at your dad or your mom is because you know what a good dad should be and you didn't get one. So maybe it's time that you let God be the father you never had. And that's also the beauty of community. Um, I know as uh, I, I have been a father type person for a lot of people, even when they were my age because of my office as a pastor. And so there's a lot of reparenting that goes on within the confines of or the, the, um, the grace of a community of people. And it's a beautiful thing. That's part of why we're in this together. Yep. Uh, God, so much good stuff in there. I've held another man and cried on his shoulder before, mm-hmm. like I was being held by my mm-hmm. dad. Mm-hmm. God, so powerful. All right, let's slow down a little <laughs> bit. Let's take it easy. The most powerful thing that I've heard you say this week that's resonated with me so much, and we all can. I mean, I don't care who you are. We all can, unless you're Pastor Joe Chambers. He's already doing it. (laughs) But we can all slow down. We can all take a breath. Mm. I fill my time to the brim. Like I fill my calendar so full that I only give myself 15 minutes in between things to reboot and get ready for the next thing. Constantly making mistakes. I'm constantly missing stuff. Uh, Just little tiny things. And I've always chalked it up to my personality. Like I'm a go, go, go person. I love being busy. I love, my wife calls it a little bit of fear of missing out that I'm that type of a person. But some of the things that really resonated with me when you were speaking last night, I think it might've been the first night, you were talking about backpacking, your backpacking trip. And my wife and I are big backpackers in one of the things that I love to do is go and sit and do nothing out in the wilderness. And I am so surprised. Like, I'm not actively pushing down any of my thoughts or emotions. I'm very well, well aware of what's going on inside of me, how I'm feeling, how I'm acting. But when I sit and be still and just let the feelings flow, let the thoughts come in, let them go, process them, put them in where they need to go as they're coming in, just 
after two days of doing that, the, 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 the refresh that I felt coming off of that camping trip was the most amazing thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I feel like it brought me back to 100% Michael to where I can be effective in mentoring other guys and just trying to be a good Christian, be a good person, be, a good, be good at my job, et cetera. So I really loved that you slowed down. And like in everybody and Pastor Joe Parks, forgive me, don't take this the wrong way. Out of everybody that I've ever talked to, I so admire your voice. I admire the way that you slowly speak, thoughtfully speak, just the way you walk into a room. You're very slow about it. And that you are the man that I want to be someday <laughs> at some Goodness. point. And I, I, I know this because you've shared that you've also got some things in your past that you're not so proud of. So you've opened up to me about that stuff too. So it's not like I'm putting you on a pedestal, but from what I know about you, you are, you are the man that I want to be someday, you know, when I, when I grow up mm -hmm. in the next <laughs> 16 years. Same. Yeah. And it, it's just so powerful. I've never met somebody that has that has soaked up into my soul so much as I had with you, with the things that you're telling me and the times that you've poured into me. And from mm -hmm. what I hear Meg talk about you and pastor Joe talk about you, all that stuff. That was a little far that I went in that, forgive me, but we're talking about slowing down. So Meg has experienced me in my hyper, hyper state recently, but I, I wanted to ask you, Meg, you're really busy at the church. You have a big job. You have a lot going on. You're newly married, newlywed. What kind of things do you see? How, how, does, how does what Joe was talking about, Pastor Joe was talking about, about slowing down, how does that resonate with you? Right off the bat, the biggest, most important thing that I have heard in the last 48 hours was earlier today, um, just for context, context for the listeners, Pastor Joe Chambers came and spent some time with the Faith Center staff um, today in a meeting format, and he kind of gave us a teaching. And, but before that, we were having just kind of an open discussion. And um, the concept of scheduling out prayer time, mm -hmm. Smacked me in the face. <laughs> it did me too. And Joe, I think I circled it three or four times <laughs> in my notes. Joe said something about, you know, if you're not, if you don't have time to pray, especially as a ministry leader, if you don't have time to pray, you're doing it wrong. And I went, I'm doing it so wrong. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to admit that because now I can just pledge to myself and the Lord that I, I need to do that. That is such a good I'm really good. I need, I rely on, this is actually the words I mean to say is I really, I rely on a calendar schedule blocked out things. And I'm not, um, you know, something that you said, Joe was, you know, we, we do this to yourself. You're, you're putting these things on your calendar. And my first knee jerk thought was like, no, I'm not. Other people are putting these things on my calendar. I don't want this. <laughs> I have bosses. I have other people who are putting things on my calendar and then um, you probably within a minute said boundaries come into play here. And mm. I went, Tah. so at the end of the day, it still falls on me <laughs> that um, I need to have, I need to have boundaries on that. And I need to have non-negotiable um, schedule out unbusyness. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big one for me because I have not been doing that right. Um, and I, I do pray for people, not regularly not consistently and not with the intention that I would really like to be. Um, because the more that I deeply believe in the power of prayer, the more that I want to. Um, and then it gets into this cycle of, I didn't even pray for anyone yesterday. I should pray right now. And it's more of a, I should instead of, um, just pouring out of me because I'm asking God to, to put that mm -hmm. in me and scheduling out the time to do that. That was a huge one for me. Because I don't, I don't want to wear busyness as a badge of honor. I don't want to be um, seen as more important for it. 
it is the reality of my life right now, but the things that you have said it, are making me want to change those things mm. for the better. Um, a recent experience I had that I hope I'm not a broken record for people who have already heard me talk about this retreat that I got to go on recently, <laughs> a young adult retreat. It did so much in my life and I felt it immediately. I came back feeling refreshed. The theme of this retreat was renewal. And then I came right back into prepping for soul care renewal. Um, and somebody's trying to tell you, something. somebody's mm -hmm. trying to tell me something. <laughs> and I, the, the whole retreat, I went there because a team and I were leading worship there. So we went there to do a job per se, but I spent way more time just being with people, playing games, hearing testimonies, chatting, just spending time. And most of my calendared out time is spending time with people. I'm around people all the time, but there's always a task at hand. There's something that we're doing. There's a mission that we're on. And this retreat gave me time to just slow down. And even though I stayed up until like one and two in the morning having so much fun, which I never thought, <laughs> I did not think I was going to be capable of doing, um, I came back feeling truly a soul, a, a change in my soul just from doing that for like two days. And that was with long travel days sandwiched. I mean, there was all these reasons that I could have come back tired, exhausted, but I was exhausted in the bet. I was so happy to be exhausted from that. Um, and so that I would loved having a recent example of how a retreat mm -hmm. to go away and be um, somewhere different than my normal busy go, go, go um, lifestyle has been just did a number on me. And that was just like such a short time. There's a there's a, a an Irish Celtic poet named John O'Donohue. He's one of my favorites. And he passed away in 2009. But he's a poet, essayist, writer. Uh, and he has a, a book of blessings. It's called uh, Bless the Space Between. And in it, there's a, there's a prayer, poem, blessing called... A blessing for one who's exhausted. And there's, towards the end of that long poem, there is, this is for someone who's exhausted. There's three or four lines I want to share with you. One of them, it says, be excessively gentle with yourself, which is hard for some of us to do. I'm looking at you, mm -hmm, brother. Mm -hmm. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Then he says, Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. You're exhausted. Whether that exhaustion could be almost anything, right? It can be work. It can be spiritual. It can be ministry. It could be parenting. It could be anything. He says... Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. What I think I love about that is you can't stay clear of those vexed in spirit all the time or you would be on a deserted island someplace. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you're exhausted, when you're depleted, when there are no margins in your life, there are people in your world, in my world, that are life suckers. They, they pull life from you. And those are not the people that I want to spend time with today. And I've even given folks permission. Just, just tell people that Joe said that you're a life sucker and I can't <laughs> spend time with you today. Wow. <laughs> Which doesn't probably go over very well in their relationship. But think about what that means. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world for you. That is a life-giving friend. That is a soul friend, that person. And we all need somebody like that. That's why we want to be you when we grow up, because that's what you make people feel <laughs> yeah. like. Well, You've made me feel uh, like that. I just... Well, you know what, though? I don't believe that that would be always true. Um there were there was a time when being driven was probably the thing that I was known for the most, and being an intimidating individual. You know, I'm a big guy, got these eyes, and I, I could get a scowl on my face, that. and yeah, I could see it. the voice, and 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 um, 
and somehow that has changed. And I think the change has been being more comfortable with who I am. Uh, I know who I am and not who I'm not. I quit trying to pose and be somebody that I was never designed to be. And actually what I'm going to talk about tonight is learning to speak from your own voice and sit in your own chair and cast your own shadow. Um, All of this is learning to be who you're really supposed to be Um, in the psychological world or the spiritual direction world. We call this the difference between the true self and false self. Most of us live out of our false self, an avatar, if you will. Um, I'm only letting you see what I want you to see. And it's my public persona, right? The problem with that is avatars aren't real and God never blesses an avatar. He only shows up and blesses the real you. So who is then? And when when that is safe for that person to come out, then there is a non-anxious presence about them. Um, there is an empathetic presence with them. And that comes from a lot of hours of being with the one who calls you beloved. That's so true. I... I figured that out about 10 or 12 years ago. I, I put on a false face, you know, most of my life. And when I decided, when I sobered up, I had the chance to re, redesign myself or re, recreate myself, whatever. I had a blank slate, whatever I wanted. Fresh start is what I'm looking for. So when I moved up here, when I got up out of rehab and got up here, I started that fresh start. And I was trying to figure out who I wanted to be. And I wanted to be the 18-year-old kid before he started using drugs, you know, the 18 year old Michael. And so I did, the only problem was, and I totally get where you're coming from, but this is, and it's the same concept of, you know, a lot of the pastors hate the person that they see in Sunday service and then see the guy that they see in Monday, on Monday. And I heard that in my head all the time. I'm like, I want to be like that. But the guy, <laughs> the guy is so different that I have to pretend to be the 18-year-old Michael again until I really figure out how to be myself again, how what that really looks like. And like not cussing anymore, you know, not dropping an F-bomb in the church was kind of important to me. So it's a good start. <laughs> yeah. It's a good start. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for a while there, to a certain extent, if you want to call it this, I had to pretend because I wasn't being the Fake it till you just, make it. Yeah, exactly. Until I just got used to being the 18-year-old Michael, Mike again, which is really fascinating to me because it was such an important milestone in the way that people look at me differently. I noticed right off the bat, people could see that I was being authentic, that I was being me and just loving me and being with me. And... Something else that I wanted to go in, like I was telling you, I keep my schedule pretty busy and I do have pretty good boundaries. I just like to, there's 16 hours in the day when I'm awake, I feel like I could be doing something. And if it's scheduled prayer time or, or being by myself, whatever it is, reading, writing, whatever it could be, where, is that a bad thing that Mm. I've got something for every piece of my schedule it or god i don't even know how to put this like i don't i like to i like to schedule my stuff out so like you're talking about scheduling prayer time scheduling reading time scheduling time with meg scheduling time with my wife scheduling time with my best friend you know all that kind of stuff is is there something wrong with that is is, am am i looking at that in the wrong light is it working for you? Well, that's what I mean. I'm not. Do you feel like? Do you feel like your soul's flourishing? Correct. With that, yeah. Then I don't have a. What am I going to say about mm-hmm. that? Yeah, if, no. If your soul's flourishing, I think that there's a. It's a knife's edge because it can then become. Um, it can be constrictive, so that if something interrupts your schedule. And I have no idea if this is, happens for you, but if something messes up your schedule, is that going to cause some heart palpitations? Um, I, I want to say this. This is going to sound a little weird, and you may be, end up editing this out. Okay, That's fine. We probably don't schedule our, our lovemaking with our spouses. 
That just happens when it happens. I would take away the the quickie or the nooner. Yeah, or whatever you want it just to call it. Ha- it happens when you romance and there's wooing and there's there's stuff that happens. You know, there's looks across the room, all of the wonderful things. And that's what makes it so beautiful and so enjoyable and so intimate. And I believe there's a reason that the the relationship between a man and a woman is held in such high regard in the Bible as a model for how our relationship with the Father or with the Holy Spirit or with Jesus is supposed to be. It's supposed to be this organic, um, beautiful, spontaneous, planned, erratic relationship. Because you're in love. And it's in it's love. And, and I, I think... Uh, I've known couples that were trying to have kids and they couldn't have kids and so they they, they went through the medical processes and and now she it's, I'm, it's time we got to go we got to go have relations you know so that we have the, increased the opportunity to have a, a conception we 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 got to do this now and there's this performance anxiety I mean all kinds of stuff happens and it's not fun <laughs> um, it's not fun but it has to get done. And that part is not exactly conducive to intimacy. Yeah, I can see that. You're, you're so true. The, the really, and it freaks me out to even compare the two in my relationship with Jesus and inviting Jesus into my bedroom and all that stuff is always yeah, weird. Not, yeah. I don't want to go too far here <laughs> with that, but, mm-hmm. but I just think the analogy of the beauty of the intimacy between a man and a woman there's a reason Song of the Solomon is in there. There's a reason Ephesians is in there about our relationship. I think you can go way too far, make this thing kind of walk on all fours right. a little bit, <laughs> and I don't want to do that. But I just know that in the relationship between my wife and I, there is intimacy. That if it's planned and scheduled out, it's not good. Yeah, no, that's so true. And when you're talking about that, though, I'm thinking about my relationship with Jesus and my relationship with my wife. And they are almost a similar, like, feeling in my soul, right? Deep down in the core of who I am. Like, all that feels good and tingly inside. You know, those, those are the two things that make yeah. me feel good mm-hmm. and tingly inside mm-hmm. is my wife and my relationship with the Lord. Amen. So, yeah, I don't, we're not calendaring our, our woohoo time out. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> not, what, what'd you call it? Our woohoo time. <laughs> woo-hoo time. Okay. I'm, I'm sure there's. I'm a learning new language here in Eureka. Huh? <laughs> uh, great, great off the wall topic that we just mm-hmm. yeah a little bit, but <laughs> no, I'm definitely leaving that in there. I love that we're talking about slowing down, but I think I'm good with slowing down. Did you have anything to add in there? You have any final comments on slowing down that you wanted to leave us off with and our audience off with? Yeah, I don't know when I said this or where I said this, um, but God just does not get in a hurry about anything. Uh, if he did, if he were in a hurry with urgency, um, the cross would have happened in Genesis 4. But it didn't happen in Genesis 4. It happened thousands of years later. So I don't understand the mysteries of God's salvation, but I know that he doesn't get in a hurry. And why we feel like we have to be in a hurry is probably more about our own brokenness than it is by walking with God. I love that. And there is one last question that I want to leave us off with. It was so important to me. It's a question that I have honestly, in my own life, it's an honest question. So how do we let God in when we know he's knocking? How do we do that inside? How, like, I'm, That's a I'm great honestly question. asking a veteran here. Mm. How I hear him knocking and I don't let him in. I just can't find that doorknob sometimes. Mm. Mm. That's a great question. You want me to ask Meg real quick to give you a little time? No, <laughs> I'm, I'll take a too. shot at it. But I'd love to hear what she has to say. I would say that why why can't I find the doorknob? That's a question I would have. I'm asking you a question with a question. But why is it, Why? what's keeping him out? 
Um, what am I afraid of? You know, honestly, a lot of this stuff about God coming close is, um, is about intimacy, and many of us are very frightened of intimacy. It's a position of vulnerability. What if he doesn't like what he sees? What if he comes in and says, this is all you got? What if, what if, and this is all, you know, we're projecting our, our parents or her spouses onto Jesus, but there's a reason why he's on the outside and wanting to come in. How do I let him in? I think there are what I would call means of grace. Um, this is where worship comes into play. This is where communion, the Lord's Supper comes into play. This is where opening time up for prayer. This is where Psalms 46.10 comes into play. Be still and know that I'm God. There are a lot of ways that I can position myself for God to show up. But the bottom line is the wind blows where it will, and I cannot control it. So I can invite him, and, and I can make a place for him at the table. Um, we'll see what happens. Right. Good, good uh, conversation that I can't find the doorknob for some reason. I need to figure out why I can't for- find the doorknob. <laughs> Meg, what, do you have any advice for me on that question? Or do you have any thoughts on that question? Um, I thought it was very profound because I can't it's find a the darn question. doorknob sometimes. It's a great question. I think the first thing that comes to mind is that I think what I have seen in the church and seen in myself too is that a lot of people get tricked thinking that they're lost or can't find something because they're waiting for the place where they're supposed to worship. They wait for Sunday to have time singing to the Lord. They wait for Sunday to get in the Word. They wait for things, church events, or the the next Bible study that they go to or something for this great revelation or some answer that they're going to receive from uh, another person. And they're not just, don't wait on that. It's, you could do it anywhere. You can do it in yeah. your bedroom. You know, I, we were talking about what that, you could do it anywhere you, in your living room. You know, it does not matter what key you're singing in. It doesn't matter what, I mean, f- for me, that's where I go is that if I don't know what's going on, my life can be crumbling around me. And if I can just sit in my living room alone and wail. <laughs> and sing something, anything that I can think of. And that, to me, ends up being kind of like my best communication language is I sit at home and literally cry because God is so amazing and can just, I just make up some song and then I just sit there and weep because he's so amazing. And if I can sit there in that, then I'm going to get what I'm looking for because I, I think you're, we're bound to m- make up something that we're looking for. We're waiting to hear an answer that w- we know what we actually probably want to hear and we're not pausing long enough to hear what's not ours to answer. Am I willing to be surprised? Right. Am I willing to be surprised by God? Um, am I curious? to let him show up in the way that he chooses. That's some of the problem that you you just described. I go to church, and if the preacher's not this, mm-hmm. the music's not that, if, if I don't get that tingly mm-hmm. in the right time when I want it, then God didn't show up. Well, you know, as a guy that's been married for 42 years, there's lots of ways for you to feel intimate mm-hmm. with someone without those... Um, those tingly feelings. My wife's not going to watch this, so I feel comfortable sharing (laughs) this. Um, But I think there's a lot more. It's a maturing faith that allows you to be anywhere and experience the presence of God. Sometimes that presence is actually made more profound because it's um, you almost feel his absence. I don't think you can know his presence if you don't also are very aware of his absence. That's a great point. Because otherwise, how would you know? Right. I I often wonder that because I don't have the experience of someone who, you know, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't. I have. I can very easily access memories of absence of God in my life. Um, 
And I think that's But how did you know he was absent? Um, for me, because I directly and intentionally did not want him to be present and completely renounced, denounced <laughs> anything negative I could say mm-hmm. about him, I said, and was like, get away from me. And, and I could feel that. I knew I did that. But, but that can, absence of God that you felt proves that he once was close. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know. That's true. That's so true. Maybe that's what he's teaching me with the doorknob right now <laughs> is the absence mm-hmm. to recognize when he's there more. He's, he may be there more when he feels absent than when he feels close. There's a saying, um, a mother is only as happy as her saddest child. Have you ever heard that? Mm. I don't know. I've, I've heard versions of it. Yeah. My mother's only as happy as her saddest child. And what I, th- what I, I love about that is when, when I'm sad, when I'm broken, when I'm hurting, God's probably closer right there yeah. mm-hmm. than at any other time. In fact, there's right. parts of God I will never know without brokenness. Yeah. Blessed are they that mourn. Mm-hmm. I won't know that blessedness. Mm-hmm. Blessed are those that are hunger and thirst. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't know that if I didn't have this discomfort, this pain in my life. Yeah. There's a parts of God I would never know without sorrow. It's true. Yeah, it draws we, near to the weary and the brokenhearted. Mm-hmm. We've talked about that two or three times on the lot, and we've only have four episodes. <laughs> Yeah, that is a recurring theme. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that you know, Joe Chambers took the staff today through a, a the River of Faith illustration, and part of the river is that you have um, class five rapids in your life. You can be down the river. There's going to be more rapids, right? And these rapids are crises in your life. You know, it it could be a number of things, and since we all have them, that concept keeps coming up. That we man, we get so down. But how good is God that that's where he can meet us so, so strong? I know that's where he met me, was when I was at my lowest. I choose to think of it as that I'm just doing really well and spiritually, so that's why I'm not leaning on him so much. He doesn't feel Mm. like he needs to come down the way that he did Mm. when I was going through the turmoil, and he knew that I needed him by my side. But that's great stuff. Thank you, Pastor Joe, for joining us. And if you all have any questions or want to leave any comments, you can make sure and do them. If you're watching on YouTube, just use them and leave them in the comments. We're still trying to work out a workflow. So if we haven't got to your comments yet, then we will get there. I promise. So keep them up. And you can also email us at openended at eurekafacecenter.org. <laughs> I said it right this week. Yeah, you did. That's great. But we'd appreciate it. We'll appreciate you to give us a review on Apple Podcast. It really helps generate the algorithm and get this out to more people. And share it with your friends. If you got something out of this and you know somebody that's hurting, you think that they can benefit from this, please go ahead and share it with your friends. And we're always, we're so encouraged by everybody that has come up to us at church, out in the community, dropped us notes, just telling us how great and how vulnerable that. Meg and I have been on these episodes and how much it's been impactful in their lives. So that's really encouraging because God has really been put, uh, not God, the devil has really been putting me through the test of uh, spiritual warfare, not to get this podcast going. So I'm always encouraged you guys keep me going. But with that, I think that it's time for the awkward part of our podcast. That is the ending. We don't know how to end. We don't. We have to leave because we need to go schedule some time to respond to comments on YouTube. Oh, is that what it is? Bye. We need to go. See you guys next week. Bye.